to is is the low cell still working? Okay, okay. So hopefully the microphone is gonna catch this. Listen, okay? Don't make any noise. You hear that? What is the load? It went down. The load is now 30, 35, 36, OK? And, and that's mostly the strength of, of, of this uh, package. This, but I'm going to break it even a little bit more. And what is the load now? It's 28. 28 is still going down. I think I'm going to make a mess here, but <laughs> Jeffrey's going to clean it, so. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what is the load now? No, no, actually, it's pretty good. I didn't make it. 14, no, but now it's, it's taking almost no load at all, OK? And I, I think it's even uh, going down. Uh, is it or not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going down to almost, to almost zero. And I'm going to take it off from here, OK? And I don't want to make a mess, but uh, I'm going to prove now that, OK. So now probably the load is closer to 0. And as you can see over here, this is just ground coffee, right? No, no bonding, uh, no cement, no nothing. So how was this uncemented material able to take 200 pounds, almost uh, 50 psi? It was. It wasn't the package itself. <coughs> we saw that when, when I broke the package and it wasn't fully broken, the load went to 30 psi, uh -huh. or 30, 30 pounds. If you divide by the area, it was almost almost 10 psi. So, um, let me tell you what's going on here. We have the package, right? It had atmospheric pressure uh, inside. There was vacuum. Inside the package, we have grains, and we saw that we were able to put an additional we were we were able to put an additional more or less uh, we said it was 200 pounds right so 200 pounds divided by 3 that would be 66 we put an additional 50 psi in addition to what we already have no 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 uh, 60, <coughs> 66 uh, PSI, in addition to what we already had uh, in there. Um, so how, how was that possible? Well, what is going on here is the same what is going on over there. If you were to look at each grain, and the contact with the other grains, because of this stress on the sides, which is an effective stress, you have forces between the particles that bring the particles together. And because there is also friction between these two grain surfaces, if you were to try to apply a transversal force, F, force FT, because of the friction, you would be able to resist that at the contacts between the grains. So is that frictional force sent to that one that allows you to have, if we call this one sigma 1, and all of these, uh, no, this one is sigma 3, minimum confining stress, effective stress, allows you to have a normal uh, maximum stress much higher than this minimum stress. 
And if you were to put it in terms of stresses, we will see something very similar to this, in which the maximum shear stress that I'm going to call tau that happens inside the material is proportional to the normal stress sigma n, same as in the previous case, through a line where tau is equal to now also the friction angle times sigma n. And for rocks, especially when we talk about uh, intact rocks, we're going to call that mu i, and the i comes from internal, internal friction angle. We'll see later on why uh, we call this internal. Uh, again, this is going to be the friction condition. It is exactly the same. So uh, let's try now to understand this. Uh, with more circles and with uh, we have learned about the stress tensor. So do you guys remember more circles? <coughs> what what are more circles? So a more circle is simply <coughs> is a graphical representation of the stress tensor. Uh, for example, uh, in, the, in the case, in the experiment that we just did, uh, we subjected the coffee to a maximum principal stress of, uh, in this case, was more or less, so we put 200 pounds, right? 200 pounds. I, I have to measure this, probably it's a little bit more, because it, it sounds a little bit high to me. But let's just keep with the numbers we used before. So 66 plus 14, uh, that will be equal to 80, right? 80 PSI, and we have 14, uh, let's say 15, it's 14.7, right? Atmospheric pressure, if I remember correctly. Or 14.2, I don't remember. 0.7, okay, let's say 15 then. 15, 15. This is a stress tensor, and it's a principal stress tensor, and let's not forget the units, these are PSI. So, the Mohr circle is just a graphical representation of this. And when we do the Mohr circle, uh, it's we draw those stresses, and I'm not going to ask you a lot about the Mohr circle, but you, you have to understand what's going on in there, okay? So the most important thing is that you have to remember that are these principal stresses? <coughs> yes. Why? Because there is no shear, right? So all, all of these are principal. So, in the Mohr circle, uh, we put and uh, we draw the uh, principal stresses in the x-axis. So in this case, for example, I have, let's say here, 15, and here, 80 PSI. Uh, this one is sigma 3, the minimum principal stress, and this one is sigma 1. I didn't say here, but sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 because we have the same pressure in the two directions, right? Okay, once you draw the, the principal stresses, uh, the next step is just to draw a circle that goes as a center, at the center of those two points, and connects the principal stresses. So, what does the circle mean? Well, before we see what the circle means, let's try to understand what those points mean. Those points 
are the principal stresses. And for example, in this case, let's say this is sigma one, and this is sigma three. Let me add a few more arrows to make sure that we agree that these are stresses, not forces. In our particular case, that was like that. What were the shear stresses on the top and on the sides? Were no, the shear, not the normal. So the normal stress <coughs> was sigma one, the one that we applied with the low frame. The stresses on the sides they were the one applied by atmospheric pressure. And we, there was no shear stress in here, in the package. Then there's nothing, there's no force in it, so it's, it's zero. So in the more circle, these two points of principal stresses, you have a normal stress, which is some number, like this one, and the shear stresses are zero. That's why in this axis that starts at zero, these points have shear, shear, shear stresses. These are the principal stresses. And the circle means all the possible state of the stresses at a given angle. And for now, let me just say, I'm gonna choose some angle like this one. At, if you were to choose an angle at this location, you will be able to calculate at this location what is the normal stress and what is the, tau st the, the shear stress at those points on, on, on that plane. And that's going to be somewhere along this circle. Notice that along the circle, uh, and not in these two points, the shear stress is not zero. And the normal stress is a value between this one and that one, right? Okay, so that is what the, the more circle is. And uh, now let's try to put this together okay. to, with what we did before. Uh, we said that the maximum shear stress depends on the normal stress, right? We said that. Uh, this is what we did over here. Well, the Morse circle, it represents the state of the stress, and it's going to be limited by this line. So whenever we reach failure, the more circle is going to touch this line. And in this case, we have an uncemented um, material. So uh, this line is going to go through zero. Remember, this is tau equal to mu i sigma n. It's just a line. And now we have more circle. So. Um, the intersection of this line with the circle at this point is going to give me the state of stress at which I have shear failure. At that point, so this is a plane, sigma n, tau, right? So I'm going to find a value of sigma n and tau that is going to be a failure. This one is not a failure. This one is not a failure. The only one which is a failure is uh, that point. And now we're objective now is going to be to find that point. Okay, so um, that was a fast review in the Morse circle, and now we have linked that to the shear uh, failure line. Let's see how we find this point. There is uh, one more property on this line that probably you're familiar with that we're going to use, and it's called the friction angle. The friction angle, which is going to be this angle over here, is mu is going to be the tangent of that friction angle and the friction al angle is going to be the <coughs> arc tangent of 
the friction coefficient, but it's just an angle, okay? So, uh, notice that this angle is the same as that angle over there, right? And if we were to draw a line from the center of the circle to the state of stress of failure, uh, you will notice that because this is a circle and this is a tangent line, this is a right angle, so 90 degrees, and therefore, uh, this angle, how much is going to be this angle over here? 90, 90 minus 5, right? And if that's 90 minus 5, what is going to be that angle over here? 5. That's going to be 5. Okay? So, and because this is a right angle 2, this is pi over 2, I'm going to find this point at friction angle plus 90 degrees from that point. Okay, so let, let me here stop one more time and come back to the principal stresses. Notice that sigma 1, which in this case is 80 in our experiment, is a point over here, and let me make this with color, probably you, you won't see, appreciate this uh, now in the projector because we cannot see color very well over there. But that point means that surface. And this point sigma 3 over here, I'm going to make it dash so it's more obvious. That point sigma 3 here means this surface. Notice that in order to go from here, from 80 to 15, we need to go an angle of 180 degrees, right? This is what happens in the Mohr circle. But in reality, in the real sample, to go from the surface of sigma 1 to the go to the surface of sigma 3, you need to go 90 degrees. So whatever is 